community learning and engagement program and working with Food Share Toronto. She believes in the power of food as a meeting place, as a tool that creates a space for people to gather around. She uh, moderates uh, workshops with some adults in mind to start uh, important discussions on, around food, uh, food practices, food ways, our food system, and uh, discuss uh, exchanging uh, uh, knowledge, uh, knowledge, uh, competence, uh, skill, for example, recipes, uh, uh, building uh, links between people around food. Her training in social work has enabled her to address, uh, to, to uh, come at food from a critical and anti-oppressive approach angle, putting the emphasis on the uh, food uh, uh, justice and sovereignty movements. She is particularly uh, uh, excited about um, the mobilization of our sto the stories we tell ourselves and we tell others uh, on food as a, a as a way of building uh, ties and building communities. Without further ado, I will give the floor to Jade. Hey, hi, thank you. <laughs> um, it's so weird hearing my bio in French, but fun. Um, my name is Jade. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm so excited to be here with you all today and to learn with you and, and from everyone on this call. Um, I'm going to start by just reading the land acknowledgement that's relevant to where I'm at here in Toronto. Um, so I know that you read a land acknowledgement for New Brunswick, for you, where you are. Um, but, you know, I think it's really important to be uh, reflecting on where we're coming from, particularly when we're talking about work around food. Um, you know, making those connections to land is really important. So Food Share acknowledges that the sacred land in which we operate is situated upon the traditional territories of the Wendat, Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabeg, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. This territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee allied nations to peaceably share and care for the lands around the Great Lakes. Food Share recognizes the many nations of indigenous people who presently live on this land, those who have spent time here, and the ancestors who have hunted and gathered on this land known as Turtle Island. Food Share recognizes and supports the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action, applying both to our work. Food Share also acknowledges the many people of African descent who are not settlers, but whose ancestors were forcibly displaced as part of the transatlantic slave trade, brought against their will and made to work on these lands. Despite the ongoing violence inflicted on Indigenous peoples and Black Canadians, Food Share is grateful for the care and contributions made to the land by Indigenous land and water defenders and Black food growers and farmers. We believe that advancing Indigenous sovereignty <clears throat> is deeply and inextricably linked to Black liberation, and we remain committed to advancing both. Uh, so I encourage you to reflect on this as we kind of move through today's session. A lot of the themes that are really present in our land acknowledgement do come up in what we're going to be talking about, um, you know, understanding how food insecurity or food injustice is very deeply embedded in these kind of broader systems of oppression that shape people's lives. Um, so with that being said, we're going to start with a little kind of like interactive fun icebreaker activity. Um, around busting some myths about food insecurity and hunger in Canada. So if you just give me one minute to share my screen here. Okay, go full screen. And I'll make myself smaller so I don't take up the screen here. Okay. So, let me move this here. Okay, so um, we're gonna go through a couple myth busters here. Um, if folks wanna interact in the chat, then that's probably the easiest way to do it since it is a pretty big group. Uh, you could also use like reactions if you wanted to use the reactions on Zoom, like maybe like a thumbs up if you think it is a true fact um, and maybe uh, what's another react here on Zoom? Um, I can't see them when I'm in 
full screen, but maybe another reaction if you think it's a myth. Um, or you could just type in the chat too if you want to say that there. Um, and we'll kind of, the purpose here is to just kind of debunk some, some common misconceptions about food insecurity and kind of do a bit of self reflection on our own maybe assumptions or biases around um, how we think about or how we frame hunger and food insecurity here. All right, so to get started. Our myth busters. All right, so our first statement here is hunger and food insecurity are not a problem here in Canada. All right, I'm seeing a lot of myths in the chat. Um, it's not surprising to me that y'all already know this based on kind of what I was seeing in the mural. It seems like folks have a lot of experience um, working around hunger and food insecurity. Um, yep, yeah, so I'm seeing everyone is seems to be in agreement that this is a myth and that is correct. Um, this is absolutely uh, not true <laughs> here in Canada. Um, hunger is often framed as a problem that's pervasive in, you know, the so-called global south or the so-called like developing world um, and not here in North America, but this isn't true. Um, here in Toronto and across Canada, uh, one in five households are food insecure and that number is, you know, growing every day as we see um, the factors that um, exacerbate food insecurity kind of increase across the country. All right, so moving on to our second statement here. Here in Canada, everyone has the right to food. Is this true or false? I see one true in the chat. True, true, true. True miss from Erin, yeah. True, play. Yeah, so I see a kind of mix of things, yep. Yeah. And when I say um, everyone has the right to food, I'm talking about um, the right to food as like an international legal right. Um, not just, you know, I think if we're all in this training, we probably all agree, like theoretically, everyone in Canada should have the right to food. Um, but I'm talking about, is this like a fact? Um, so I see mostly folks are saying true um, and that is correct. So, uh, Canada is a signatory to the UN Declaration on Human Rights, um, and in this international document, the right to food is enshrined. Um, you know, additionally, in 1976, Canada signed the UN Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, uh, in which they basically accepted a legal responsibility to respect, protect, and fulfill the right to food for everyone living in Canada. Um, so our government took it upon themselves to sign onto these international legal documents saying that they would guarantee the right to food uh, for people living here, right? And that was the choice. It was an active choice. Um, there's other so-called, you know, um, developed countries that chose not to sign onto that document. Um, so the United States, for example, did not sign onto this document um, and did not kind of sign up for that responsibility to guarantee this right to food. So it's important to think about um, what the responsibilities of our state are um, in having signed that document. Alrighty. So our next statement is, to guarantee people's right to food, our food system needs to produce more food. So what do we think? We see a false in the chat, false, false and influx of falses here. Yeah, so it looks like we're all pretty much in agreement here. So yes, you are all correct. That is a myth, it's false. Uh, the global food system itself already produces enough food to feed uh, more than one and a half times the global population. So the problem here is not about um, there not being enough food in the world. It's about, um, it's an issue of access. It's an issue of affordability. It's an issue of whether the food that's being produced is the food that people want to eat. Um, so these are the questions that we need to ask, not how can we make more food, right? Because we already know there's these kind of like massive um, monoculture farms all across the world that are producing so much food all the time. Alrighty. We're doing amazing here. Okay. Our next statement is food banks and other emergency food aid programs solve the problem of food insecurity and can help us guarantee our right to food. So do we think that is true or false? Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of false myths in the chat. I see some trues. 
Yeah, so I think, you know, this is a bit of like a mixed bag in terms of how people think about and understand um, food banks and, and emergency food programming. Um, so I have it down as a myth. Um, and we're gonna dive a bit deeper into this later on in the session. Um, but generally kind of as a, an overarching statement, we can say that food banking is a Band-Aid solution to food insecurity. So it's a charity-based response to food insecurity that's not necessarily sustainable in the long term. Um, and what we see oftentimes in food banks is that they might strip folks of their agency, um, of dignity over power, over what they eat. Um, so when we're talking about, you know, a quote unquote, true solution to food insecurity, we need to be thinking about um, systemic changes and thinking about these kind of broader systems and structures that shape people's access to food, right? So food banking is more of like an immediate solution, an immediate response to someone being hungry that day or not having food access to food that day. But we need to be thinking longer term when we're talking about solutions, right? Okay. So our food system currently frames food as a commodity, not as a human right. What do we think? Is this true or false? Oh, and I see Aaron in the chat had said, um, food banks treat the symptom, not the root cause. Absolutely, that is very, very true. Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of truths in the chat about this one. Seems like we all agree that is a fact. Uh, so as it stands currently, the food system definitely prioritizes profit over basic human rights. Um, for example, in uh, February of this year, Loblaws, which is a big grocery store chain, reported its fourth quarter profit as being more than double um, than the year before, right? And this is during a, a global pandemic. Um, so these kind of like corporate giants in the food system continue to profit off of a global pandemic. Uh, while food prices continue to soar in these same stores, uh, which makes it really difficult for many people living here to afford food. Um, and then I think also to complicate that, it's really important to think about the working conditions for people in these stores as well, right? Many of the people who work for Loblaws uh, don't make enough money to even afford food themselves, right? So it's kind of like this, this system, um, this circular system that we need to consider here. All right. Okay, Black households in Canada are almost two times more likely to be food insecure than white households. Is this true or false? I see some truths in the chat here. Yeah, some more truths. Okay, maybe even higher from Aaron. Yeah, so um, this is a fact and it can be higher in some cases. This is kind of just like the average based across Canada, but it's definitely higher in many cases. Um, so yeah, certain people in communities face way more systemic barriers to accessing food. Uh, Black folks, indigenous communities, uh, queer folks, disabled people, um, and other folks who have kind of marginalized intersecting identities often experience the highest rates of food insecurity as a result of facing so many different uh, barriers to accessing food, right? Um, okay, so I see Nadine saying, I think we have to break down the idea of food insecurity. Yeah, so we're gonna get to that for sure. I think it's really important to, to have some key definitions um, for this chat. Thank you. Alrighty. Okay, so the main reason why people have trouble accessing food is because they don't have jobs. Is this true or false? See some falses, false, false, false in all caps, love that. <laughs> yes, so this is absolutely a myth. 65% of people experiencing food insecurity report their main source of income as wages or salaries for employment, right? So they're working. Uh, the issue is not that people are not working. The issue is that um, there is a lack of living wages. There is a lack of decent work. Um, there, you know, people not being able to access food or not being able to afford food is very much deeply rooted in um, a system of structural poverty, right? It doesn't have to do with people um, not getting jobs, which is also, it's often like the narrative that is pushed by people, right? So I think it's important to kind of um, critically reflect on that, which obviously everyone in this group seems to be doing, which is amazing. Alrighty, so I um, encourage folks to just take a minute to reflect, um, think about our own kind of like assumptions and beliefs 
it seems like most people here were already thinking quite critically about a lot of these statements, um, but I'm just wondering if anything came up during, um, you know, the, the succession of statements that surprised you or made you kind of think differently about anything, feel free to type in the chat. Um, anything that came up that you want to like look into more, or explore more deeply, or just any kind of like initial thoughts um, about kind of like the, the state of food insecurity across Canada um, that's kind of reflected. Um, so Aaron says, just because something has a right doesn't mean it's actioned upon. Absolutely. That's a really, really important thing to think about when we're talking about food insecurity in Canada, right? Um, just because our government has um, taken responsibility for something doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to implement policy um, or laws or put budget behind enacting that right, right? Um, so that's, that's really crucial. And I think part of what we need to do is think about like, how do we hold the government responsible, right? If they've claimed responsibility for this, how do we hold them accountable for what they've um, voluntarily signed up to do for everyone living in Canada? Um, Nadine says, shocked at the greed and lack of humanity from corporations. Absolutely, right? Um, I think, you know, the corporate takeover of, of our food system is a really important thing to be thinking about and, and considering when we're doing uh, work within the food system, because we see it not only in reflected in something like a corporate grocery store, like Loblaws, or these kind of big chains that we find across the country, but also in corporate farming, right? We see these kind of like huge corporate farms that have taken over um, so much land across across the country to grow food, and they are in cahoots with these big gro grocery stores, and they're also like often receiving um, subsidies from the state, right? So I think it's really important to think about all of these connections um, and how capitalism and profit really um, shape our food system in such clear and definitive ways. Um, I see, I cannot believe I work this hard to be this poor is something I often hear and often say, yeah, absolutely, right? So considering, I think, how important it is to be when we're talking about food insecurity to be talking about something like a living wage or to be talking about um, decent work right those th two things are so inextricably linked that we can never be having a conversation about food insecurity without talking about wages and talking about affordability right and that also like more broadly is connected to like affordable housing affordable child care uh, affordable health care all of these things right so um, that's that's really crucial. Um, a maze of food that goes to landfills. Yeah, absolutely, right? There's there's so much waste despite um, so much food being produced, enough food to feed everyone. There's so many folks going uh, without food and yet our landfills are being filled um, uh, on a daily basis, right? So much food is being wasted. And also considering too, like how do those landfills affect the communities around them, right? So like who is, um, feeling the impacts of these landfills being filled with food and waste. Um, you know, why are Black and Indigenous communities located in close, close proximity to landfills and how is that affecting their health, right? So the food system also has like this, um, this effect of environmental racism as well. Okay, yeah, so recent studies show 58% of food in, is wasted in Canada. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really big um, issue, right? It's something that's happening and thinking about creative solutions is, is important for sure. All right, so we're going to move on. Thank you everyone for your enthusiastic participation in that activity. Um, it's always really great to kind of figure out, um, get a sense of where people are at and, and what folks are thinking. It seems like people are really coming into this with um, a lot of really great critical thinking skills. So I'm super happy to, to see that. Okay, so as uh, Nadine had suggested, we're gonna kind of start by defining some key terms here. Um, so maybe we can do this a little bit interactively through a brainstorm before I move to the next slide where I have my kind of like pre-written definition. So why don't we start with food insecurity? What do folks think, and feel free to type it in the chat, what is food insecurity? How, what are some kind of like main things we think about when we're talking about food insecurity? I'll give folks a sec to gather your thoughts and type them in there. The 
5K. Not sure if there'll be enough food for myself, my family on an ongoing basis, right? Um, instability for an individual or household acquiring their next meal, absolutely. Lack of access to affordable food that's healthy, for sure. Ability of individuals to have access to healthy, culturally appropriate food um, in a timely manner, reasonable price, food deserts. Yes, all of these are really important um, things to think about. I like that folks are talking not only about like quantity, but also about the quality of the food, right? So the fact that it needs to be culturally um, reflective for folks, the fact that it needs to be affordable, the fact that it should be nutritious and the things that people want to eat, right? Um, and then also, you know, I like that someone mentioned kind of like this notion of instability is really important too, right? It, it doesn't have to be like severe food insecurity it can also, it's important to talk about like the precarity and the ups and downs and like the reality of living like paycheck to paycheck and one week maybe having enough to buy groceries and the next week not, right? Um, not knowing how to use those foods. Yeah, for sure, right? Sometimes there is an education piece that needs to happen depending on where folks are coming from, where they're living, what their um, childhood was like. Um, insufficient food to support a healthy and productive lifestyle for sure, right? Just like this idea of like not having enough food to like thrive. You don't wanna just be surviving, right? You wanna be able to like live a good, happy life um, and you wanna be happy about the food that you're eating. Um, and then I see too, maybe a systemic level is the supply chain secure and resilient to climate hazards? Can it reduce living wages? Yes, absolutely, right? So. I've seen in people's comments here, a bunch of different levels of food insecurity reflected, right? So um, talking about yourself, talking about you as an individual, talking about your family, um, talking about your community or neighborhood, and then also, you know, the food chain itself or the food system itself, um, is that secure, right? Like a climate disaster is a real thing and how is that gonna affect our food supply? How is that gonna affect the people who are farming our food? Um, the people living in grocery store or working in grocery stores, right? So there's all of these kinds of different levels. Um, so thank you everyone for that. Um, what about food charity? What do we think um, a definition of food charity would be? Another way to frame it might be like charity-based food aid. Um, charity-based food programming, emergency food aid. Um, so I see Nadine saying food banks, soup kitchens, community meal programs. Yep, those are all really good examples of food charity for sure. Any other thoughts? Hot lunch programs at schools, giving away food to solve an immediate deficit, growing, giving some community uh, gardens. Food charity gives people as if they need it, doesn't empower them and isn't a long-term solution providing food, community garden, meal delivery, community food baskets, school food programs, church. Yeah, all of these are really good examples um, and kind of understandings of food charity. So uh, underfunded, undervalued, emergency food pantries, soup kitchens. Yeah, so basically um, a lot of really good ideas coming up here. I think some of the key kind of highlights are that food charity is something that looks at um, the issue of hunger, the issue of food insecurity as um, how can we respond to this in kind of like an immediate or emergency way, right? So a lot of them uh, focus on providing a meal that day or providing grocery ingredients that day. Um, but like, I can't remember who it was that said in the chat, it doesn't look necessarily at the long term, right? It's not a sustainable solution to the issue of food insecurity. Uh, like someone had mentioned in the chat earlier, it looks at the symptoms rather than the root causes of the problem. Um, people often need to prove their need for food um, and meet eligibility. Very, very important thing to think about that we'll be uh, looking at a little bit later as well. Um, right, this kind of like idea of like the deserving versus undeserving when it comes to food banks, like who um, is an acceptable food bank user and who isn't and how do you prove that? Um, is a big question that comes up, often underfunded for sure. Um, it is like the government's kind of go-to response to food insecurity, but it's still often like they, the state isn't giving that much money to food banks at the end of the day, right? Makes people feel bad for sure, right? It's It's been criticized in many, many different ways as like being 
the not not very dignified way to access food, right? People are often made to feel like they're meant to be thankful or grateful for the services they're um, accessing at a food bank. These are all really um, important ideas that we will definitely return to a little bit later in the session. So thank you everyone for, for sharing these thoughts. Okay, and then our last term here is food justice. Do we have some ideas around how we would define food justice? Okay, so Nadine says, the ability of everyone to have access to healthy and appropriate foods regardless of their status, um, financial um, or geographical location and fighting for these human rights, for sure. Equitable access to land to grow food, food sovereignty, system where everyone has access to healthy and culturally appropriate food, for sure. I like that a lot of these are mentioning like systems. I think uh, when we're talking about food justice, this idea of systemic change is really important. Um, of having like a just or equitable like whole system. Um, education of people so they know their rights, absolutely, right? Like the fact that people living in Canada have a right to food is not something that most people know. Um, you know, and so people often don't know that they have the right to hold their government accountable for that. Um, access, affordability, health, ability to participate. Ability to participate is a huge one, right? Like. Um, as our food system currently stands, we're so far removed from it and often feel quite powerless in the face of it, right? And so like the ability to be an active participant in that system, I think is really important. Um, I also saw someone talking about like land access, um, food sovereignty is so important too, right? We could talk about indigenous food sovereignty, black food sovereignty, um, these, these communities that have historically been and are continuing to be, um, oppressed within our food system and how do we create new systems that can kind of like work in harmony with one another uh, that respect people's sovereignty and, and um, self-determination, right? Uh, dumpster diving outside restaurants um, and grocery stores and sharing discarded food. Yeah, that's a really good example of like mutual aid, right? And mutual aid is a big part of food justice as well. Um, Adver uh, so advertisement environments, target population, soil health, seed saving, pesticides, agroecology, organic growing. Yeah, all of these things, right? So again, thinking about the food system as a whole, rather than just talking about food access, right? It's also about how is our food being grown? Who has access to grow food? Um, you know, moving away from like this kind of corporate takeover of agriculture is so important. So these are all really good. Um, things to think about when we're talking about food justice. I'm just reviewing the chat to see if I missed anything here. Um, I've, I see like, you know, the word like equity coming up a lot. I think that's when we're talking about food justice, right? Just like the fact that we're trying to um, shift away from charity and towards justice and equity is really important here. All right, so here are my definitions and I'll, I'll read them to you and everyone will receive this PowerPoint. So no need to kind of like rush to write these down. Um, but these are kind of just like what folks have already said, just in maybe like two sentences instead of a bunch of really good ones in the chat. So food insecurity I have defined as the state of being without reliable access to a sufficient quantity of affordable, nutritious food as a result of broader systems of oppression, such as poverty, racism, colonialism, and so on. Um, food charity, I have as an approach to food insecurity that responds to immediate need through the distribution of emergency food. So like we said in the chat, examples include food banks, drop-in centers, um, and so on. And finally, food justice is an approach to food insecurity that recognizes its root causes and seeks to dismantle syst systemic forms of oppression that exist in our food system and food movement. Um, so these are very much reflections of what folks have already shared. So I feel good that we're all pretty comfortable with these terms um, and can kind of move forward to look a bit at the landscape of food insecurity across the country now. Okay, so I just have some stats here um, that I'm gonna read out. And then I want us to take a minute to kind of reflect on these statistics and what we can, can kind of learn from each of them. Okay, so I'll just go through and read them. I've got a couple of slides of these. So food insecurity in Canada. One in five households are food insecure. 62% of Canadians who experience food insecurity have jobs. 
70% of households reliant on social assistance are food insecure. 28.2% uh, of Indigenous households are food insecure. 28.9% of Black households are food insecure. 12.4% of white children live in food insecure households, while 36.6% of Black children live in food insecure households. Okay, I'll give folks a minute to kind of read through those before I go to the next slide. Uh, Nadine, these were taken from a bunch of different sources. I do have a list of them separate, but a lot of them were taken from proof research um, at U of T here in Toronto. Okay, continuing here. Oops. Uh, so there was a 600% increase in calls to 2011 for emergency food relief during COVID-19. Um, disabled folks experience food insecurity at rates three times higher than non-disabled people. Uh, bisexual Canadians are three times more likely to be food insecure than heterosexual Canadians. Okay, so consider these. And we're gonna zoom into New Brunswick for a minute as well. So these are kind of like broadly Canadian stats, um, but looking specifically at New Brunswick, New Brunswick was found to have the second highest provincial rate of food insecurity across the country at 19%. The only one that was higher was Alberta. Uh, the province also has a high prevalence of severe food insecurity at 5.9%. Um, a food bank based in Moncton has seen about 30% more clients across its 160 agencies since the beginning of 2022. And in 2018, only about one in five households experiencing food insecurity in New Brunswick actually accessed a food bank. Okay. So I want folks to kind of reflect on these numbers. I know there was a lot of them kind of thrown at you. Um, again, you will receive these slides so you can kind of like look at these in more detail on your own time. But I want folks to take a minute to reflect um, and consider what systems or structures of oppression do you see reflected in these numbers. Um, so I'll go back through so you can kind of like read through the slides again, but I just want you to consider like what systems or structures are we seeing here right. Um, so we've talked already a lot about structural poverty and that's clearly reflected in the stats when we look at them right, so we can see that there's people who have jobs who are experiencing food insecurity, people relying on social assistance are experiencing food insecurity. And so that's obviously an issue of structural poverty, right? The fact that um, living wages are not accessible, the fact that social assistance um, and benefits are clearly not covering um, people's like most basic needs and rights. Um, so that's one example of a system that we're seeing reflected here. So I'm just wondering if people wanna type in the chat, what other systems or structures of oppression you're seeing um, reflected in people's experiences here. Food system is organized and motivated by profit. Absolutely, so profit and capitalism, a huge one, right? The fact that food is so unaffordable is not a mistake, it's not an accident. Um, it's because people um, have decided to capitalize on it as um, a commodity, right? Rather than as a right. Um, I see racism, yep, systemic racism, obviously showing up in these stats here. We see that BIPOC folks are disproportionately impacted by food insecurity. Um, and that shows up in a lot of different ways, right? Um, I also saw here colonialism and colonialism goes hand in hand with systemic racism, right? Um, so if we think about the ways that settler colonialism shapes our food system, we might think about the way that, um, you know, the residential system uh, forced people to kind of disconnect from traditional diets and traditional food ways, or also the way that reserves uh, physically separated people from their traditional like hunting lands or fishing lands. Uh, we could look at modern day examples too with, you know, like the Mi'kmaq fisher folk um, on the East Coast and how um, the state continues to disrupt um, and attempt to destroy traditional indigenous food practices. 
we could look at the fact that there are so many indigenous communities across the country that don't have access to clean drinking water. Um, these are all examples of the state um, imposing like settler colonial um, projects on indigenous uh, traditions and foodways, right? And that obviously affects people's relationships with food uh, continuously today. Um, in terms of systemic racism showing up in the food system, um, we're seeing that black folks are obviously disproportionately impacted by food insecurity. Um, we know that black folks are more likely to be working kind of like lower paying jobs. So that obviously affects, um, you know, and like frontline positions during the pandemic. Um, you know, we know that there is policing that happens in grocery stores. If we look at like security, um, someone earlier mentioned, you know, this notion of food deserts um, and food desert is a term that we've actually shifted away from using at FoodShare and we use food apartheid now um, because we think it kind of reflects more accurately the way that um, certain marginalized communities not having access to, you know, like affordable or fresh produce is not a mistake, right? It's an issue of planning. It's an issue of certain communities being deprived of resources, of funding. Um, and it's very much like a, a carefully constructed thing. It's not just like an accident that happened in nature. Um, but yeah, thinking about how black folks definitely don't have the same levels of access to all of these, these resources, right? Um, okay, food wasn't a focus during pandemic, mass job loss, absolutely, right? That's a big, big issue. We, did, we didn't see a lot of action from our government except for more funding being funneled into food banking, uh, which we know isn't a true solution. Um, but we did see, I think, a really hopeful and like interesting phenomenon with like an influx of mutual aid initiatives on the ground. So like communities taking um, power into their own hands to feed their neighbors and themselves. Um, difficulty to navigate the systems for low literacy population, for sure, right? We could think about also folks like um, migrant farm workers, right? How difficult it must be to, to access and navigate like social supports and social benefits and, you know, even going to a food bank when you're living on a farm that's quite rural is very difficult. Um, so navigating systems can be really, really hard. Um, so I agree the system is oppressive, uh, but I do feel that blaming the system, it takes away our personal power. Um, yeah, so I think it's important to name the systems and to identify all of the issues, but then also to talk about um, what we as communities can do to change those systems, right? Um, but understanding what's going on, I think, is crucial um, in being able to make meaningful changes um, and changes that actually can be sustainable in long term, right? There are a lot of things we can do individually and as communities, um, and also a lot of pressure that we can put on the government to, to change things, too. So thanks for sharing that, Nadine. Um, we're overly reliant on industrial food supply chain, making us vulnerable to high inflation affordability. Absolutely, right? Our food chain is just like so big. Um, it's so reliant on corporate agriculture, which we know isn't necessarily like agriculture for the people. Um, and it often oppresses, you know, like peasant farmers who are kind of like the backbone of um, the food chain all across, across the global south. So considering our relationship to kind of like this industrial food chain is really important, right? And also the people working along the food chain who aren't farmers, so people working like in warehouses or people working at the grocery store, right? All of these um, kind of junctures are really important to consider when we're talking about, about um, food justice. Um, Alicia says, so many people have no idea how to grow food or where it comes from. For sure, right? There's an intentional kind of like divide between us and our food system. Um, because when people don't know where their food is coming from or don't know how it's grown, it makes it a lot harder for people to feel um, brave enough to, to push for changes, right? And so this is very intentional too, thinking about this. Um, seasonal jobs can impact the ability to access food year round, for sure, right? And again, coming back to like um, seasonal agricultural workers, folks coming in from other countries who are brought in to work on farms, um, and the conditions in which they work is, is really crucial too. Okay, does anyone have any other thoughts here? I know that we're probably getting close to break time if we haven't already gone over time. So um, any like last thoughts about any of these numbers, feel free to share them in the chat.
these are just some more key terms that um, y'all again will get these slides so you can read through these on your own time if you or if you ever need like a definition to look back on for oppression or intersectionality. Um, but basically to kind of like wrap up this first half of our session, um, you know, it's impossible to talk about food or food insecurity without talking about all of the broader systems that it's rooted in, right? So having this kind of like context, I think is really important when we're looking at, you know, these numbers or these stats, we need to be like contextualizing them within these broader systems to understand where the changes need to happen. Um, so in that way, any, you know, meaningful solution to the problem of food insecurity has to take into account these sites of oppression. Um, so it's not always just about food, right? I think that's one of our big issues as like a mainstream food movement is, is focusing exclusively on food. Um, when we're talking about food insecurity, when food insecurity is an issue of income, it's an issue of affordability, it's an issue of racism. Um, and so any meaningful solution needs to be intersectional and kind of like embedded within all of these changes. So we'll look a bit deeper into that after our break, um, but I think now is time to take a break. I'm not sure how long we're taking, so maybe I'll hand it back over to our facilitators to let us know. Yeah, thank you so much, Jade. On va prendre une pause de 10 minutes, so 10 minutes for a break, and then we'll be back. 10 minute with... break. Okay, so uh, for the second half, we're going to talk a bit more and focus more on solutions. So we're thinking about and questioning, you know, how do we move forward? Um, you know, as individuals, as communities, as organizations, perhaps, um, what options do we have? What has already been done or what is being done on the ground already? Um, and what can we kind of look towards as the future? So uh, we're going to start by, I'm just going to kind of run through food charity. Um, we've already, you know, started to kind of explore this, but I'm just going to kind of go through some talking points I have around what food charity is. Um, and why it's not really working currently as it stands. Um, so as we know, food charity is kind of the dominant response, um, you know, Canada, Canada as a state, their dominant response to food insecurity as a problem. Um, so what is food charity? Like we said, it includes programs like food banks, drop-in meals, and so on that provide emergency access to food. Um, just for a bit of historical context, uh, the first food bank opened in Canada in 1981 um, as a temporary response to a recession. Um, it was opened by uh, community members. It wasn't opened by the state. Um, it was opened just by like folks who got together and they're like, we got to help our community, got to help our neighbors. Um, and it has now, you know, it hasn't actually been that long. 1981 isn't that long ago. Um, and yet over the last 40 years, it has really become Kind of entrenched and like deeply embedded in Canada's um, like state response to food insecurity, right? It's kind of the government's go-to solution to food insecurity now. Um, although it's often funded by the state or like partially funded by the state, uh, food charity initiatives are often operated by the nonprofit sector, um, operated by religious organizations like churches, um, and other kind of community-based groups, right? So although the state often kind of funnels money into these responses, they're not necessarily running them. Um, it's, it's community members who are often running these initiatives. Um, food banking kind of has its origins in the early 1800s here in Canada, um, back when wealthy white women who um, were part of their churches would collect and distribute food to, you know, the poor through their churches. That's kind of like the historical roots of food banking. So we know there are ties to um, Christianity um, and churches when we think about the origins of food um, banking and, and food charity, right? I mean, the word charity itself obviously is directly linked to um, Christianity and um, kind of like Christian morals around that. Um, and like someone said in the chat earlier, uh, food charity initiatives often people require people to meet certain eligibility criteria, right? Um, and that might be around like their income levels. So like providing like a pay stub or your last paycheck is, is something that does happen quite frequently at food banks. Um, providing like proof of home address to show that you're in a catchment area. 
um, which, you know, would obviously be tenuous if you're like experiencing homelessness or housing insecurity. Um, immigration status is another one. Um, you know, if, you're ha if you have precarious immigration status, if you're here um, and you're undocumented, you might not be able to access uh, food banks. So kind of like all of these different eligibility requirements um, come up in different ways at different food banks. And there are definitely some food banks that are way more radical, way more progressive that might not ask for any documentation or any eligibility. Uh, but then there's others that are kind of like more traditional and rooted in these kind of like charity based models that do require like quite a bit of documentation. Um, and it's important also to note that like the people running these food banks aren't the ones asking for this oftentimes it's like a requirement for funding from the state right so like Canada, the state like the federal government will give you funding for your food bank if you report on certain. Um, like who you're serving and how many people you're serving and often that requires documentation too right so it's not just a problem like at the level of people running food banks but you know like who's funding those food banks and what they need to know to be able to continue funding that food bank so um i have some quotes here from some different kind of like food activists across the country about whether or not food charity works the resounding answer is no it does not work <laughs> Um, so Valerie Teresuk from Proof Toronto uh, said, even before the pandemic, when we look at the data, food charities would at most have seen one sixth of the people who were struggling. Um, and we have no evidence to suggest that they help people, um, the help that people get from those organizations is sufficient to meet those needs, right? So, you know, most people who are experiencing food insecurity aren't actually accessing food banks is kind of the what we hear from food activists across the country. Um, so Carolyn Stewart from Feed Ontario said, many people who are food insecure are actually more likely to borrow from family or friends, take out payday loans or deplete their savings before using a food bank, right? So people will cut a bunch of other things out of their budget um, or go without food um, rather than using a food bank because as some people mentioned earlier, it's often not dignified, it feels embarrassing or shameful to access them or the treatment you receive at a food bank as a user um, can often be kind of like humiliating. Um, and Elaine Power, Valerie Teresuk and Paul Taylor uh, in an op-ed for the Toronto Star, I believe said for every person who visits a food bank, we know there are another three or four people who are never even getting to the food bank. Uh, for many people using food bank as a symbol of hitting rock bottom um, and some would rather just go hungry than swallow their dignity, right? So again, these ideas coming up around people using food banks as like a very, very last resort, right? Um, and also thinking to, you know, we talk about it being like a, not a dignified space to access food, but also like the cultural stigma around using a food bank is really important too, right? And in certain communities, like going to a food bank is not an option because communities are so close knit and people, you know, talk about things and people are worried about having that kind of like stigma attached to them or their family uh, when it comes to using a food bank. So um, questioning kind of like why food charity doesn't work, why food banking doesn't work. Um, you know, I think one of the main issues here is that food banking or food charity really frames food insecurity as um, a charitable cause that requires handouts. Uh, rather than as a violation of people's basic human rights, right? So it's it's very much framing food as this thing that we're like giving people and they should be thankful for um, rather than like, this is an issue of like people not being able to access their like basic human rights and needs. Um, food within the system is seen as a commodity. So food banks are often very closely tied up with corporations. Um, so at the federal level, like a lot of, there are a lot of, opportunities for like tax credits or tax write-offs for these kind of big corporations who donate surplus or unwanted food to food banks, um, who give donations to food banks. Um, there's kind of like a lot of benefits for corporations who engage with the system. Um, so there's this kind of like unholy love triangle between like uh, food banks, the state and corporate like Canada. Um, so thinking about the, that relationship is really important when we consider food banking. Um, in many ways, food banks uh, replicate settler colonial and Christian white savior dynamics. Um, you know, they often position the food bank and its staff, the people working there, the volunteers as like a helper, right? Um, and as the people coming in as like needy or poor. Um, and 
you know, like considering to like who works at a food bank, what do their staff look like and who's accessing the food bank is also important to question, right? Like are the people working at the food bank mostly white um, and are the people accessing the food bank mostly not white? Um, and what does that say about the, the power dynamics that would come up then when you're going to access food, right? Um, you know, because also when we think about this, food banks rely heavily on volunteer label, labor um, and the folks who are able to volunteer their time for free are often like upper middle class white folks, right? In a lot of communities, right? So that, that ends up then that we see a lot of white folks working as the servers at food banks um, and that can replicate a lot of like really problematic dynamics for communities um, where these food banks are located. Um, also, like someone had mentioned, eligibility requirements and policing around this make accessing food banks feel shameful, uh, embarrassing. It's not a dignified way to access food. Um, you know, most people aren't going to a food bank because they want to. Um, so it seems ludicrous that you need to you need to show all of these like documents to be able to just like get a basket of food, right? Most people aren't just going there as like for fun, um, and yet you need to show up with all of this like very detailed um documentation to, to access food in a lot of cases uh, we also know that food charity strips people accessing the service of agency over what they want to eat right so i think this notion of like agency this notion of choice or like power over what we're eating is really really important when we're talking about um, food justice or like food security um, so it's not just a matter of like people having enough calories to survive. But like I said earlier, people being able to eat the food that they want to eat and like thrive. Um, so, you know, thinking about whether food is like culturally appropriate, um, whether it's the food that makes people feel good in their own bodies, right? Like we have a lot of ideas, I think, about what we think people should eat. Um, but the, at the end of the day, people are the, like, you know, you're the only one who knows what's gonna make you feel good and what's gonna fuel your body best. Um, and something like a food bank uh, is not giving people choice over what they can eat or what they're not going to eat. Um, so thinking about that that aspect of, of agency is really crucial. Um, at the kind of like, at a higher level, food banking or food charity as a response really allows the Canadian government to take an arm's length approach to the issue of food insecurity, right? So it's something that started as a community response and the Canadian government saw that happening across the country and they're like, oh, this is an easy way for us to kind of like offload this responsibility for the right to food onto the nonprofit sector, onto communities. We'll like throw a bit of money at it every once in a while, but you know, this other sector can kind of like take responsibility for this thing. Um, and what this does at the end of the day is it really like gives them an opportunity to kind of like shirk that responsibility and that doesn't put a lot of pressure on them then to implement meaningful policy changes, right? So instead of seeing actual like systemic changes around policy, around like our food system, around like corporate agriculture, instead we just see the government like funneling a bunch of money into food banking. Like that's what we saw over the course of like the beginning of the pandemic and continue to see. Um, sorry, I saw a comment in the chat. Let me just open it. Um, so I see a question here, Jade, would you see, so would you say that a product, produce box model of food distribution removes agency from people or is this mainly for charitable food? Um, so I think that, I think a produce, box are you talking about like a, like a subscription box or could you like give me some more context maybe subscription yeah um yeah so like food share we do like a, a good food box um subscription box option um and i think in some ways it it does remove the you know you don't get to pick what's in your box every week um so like in some ways there's like a little bit less agency but you know it does increase affordability of fresh produce for folks which sometimes might be in, and they're opting into it right so there is agency there in that decision as well to like sign up for a produce box um 
I think thinking about what's in the produce box is really important though, right? Like, is there like culturally diverse food in the produce box? Is it reflective of like local um, farmers and like independent farmers rather than like corporate agriculture, right? So like, I think you can have a produce box that is reflecting the people who are subscribing to it maybe. Um, but I wouldn't say it like is stripping people of agency because like at the end of the day, you are like opting into it. Those are my thoughts. Um, yeah, no worries. Thanks for asking that. It's a great question. Um, okay, and then I, my final talking point here on food charity is that, you know, at the end of the day, it is a band-aid solution. Um, it's treating the symptoms of food insecurity, not the root causes, as someone had mentioned in the chat. Um, it's not implementing like a long-term change to our system, right? So like the problem stays the same. Um, I do want to highlight, you know, like food banking is not bad. Um, food charity is not bad. We obviously need food charity because there is such a pervasive issue of food insecurity and like severe food insecurity in Canada. People do need immediate access and emergency access to food on a daily basis. Um, but my point here is that we need to not only focus on food charity when we're talking about our responses to food insecurity, right? So right now we need it, but the goal is to build towards a system where we don't need food, secure, food charity, right? So it's kind of like a two-pronged or three-pronged solution. Um, and in the meantime, food charity is something that we need to unfortunately continue so that people are able to like survive from day to day. All right, so if not food charity, then what is the question? Um, and this is where food justice comes into the picture. Uh, so what is food justice? What makes it tick? Uh, food justice um, initiatives are community led. So they are bottom up rather than top down, right? So most food banking or food charity initiatives are kind of like a top down approach where someone is deciding what someone else will eat. Someone decides what a community needs who isn't necessarily from that community. Um, food justice initiatives are always driven by the people most impacted by food insecurity, poverty, and racism. It's communities deciding for themselves, um, you know, engaging in self-determination and food sovereignty, like what it is that they need and making changes based on that. Um, within any food justice movement, food is framed as a human right rather than as a commodity. Um, you know, the notion of human rights, I think is it's important to highlight that like within certain um, indigenous frameworks and worldviews, human rights like aren't necessarily like framed in the same way as like we understand them in like a Western settler way. Um, but the like main point here is that food is not seen as a commodity within food justice movements um, and food justice initiatives, right? It's something that we are having a relationship with. It's something that we need to survive, um, thinking about a relationship to land and all of these things. Um, Food justice is focused on making long-term changes and transforming systems, like I said, right? It's not just about today. Um, it's about what is gonna happen seven years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Um, and as a result of that, it's often like a very like slow going change too, right? We can't just be like, we're gonna do food justice work and like tomorrow we'll see a completely new system. It's something that you really need to like invest in um, and work on for a very long time. Um, I once heard Karen Washington speak, um, who's an organizer in New York City, and she said that food justice is a verb, um, and that's something that really stuck with me. So this idea that like doing food justice work, it's an action, right? And it's something that you're continually engaging in. It's not like a one and done type thing. Um, and finally, food justice is expansive. So it's, like I said, it's not only focused on food, but it's talking about income, it's talking about living wages, it's talking about affordability, childcare, housing, education, healthcare, all of these different systems, right? So it's moving away from this very like siloed approach to um, addressing food insecurity to a more like collaborative, holistic, comprehensive understanding of why food insecurity exists and how do we change that? Um, I see in the chat here, Alicia says, I used to work for a food bank and at a national conference, a speaker said, Food bankers are one of the only organizations that want to run themselves out of job. And it's so true. We know we're a band-aid solution and we want to make the system to make it obsolete. For sure, right? It's like any like radical or progressive food bank should want to like not exist 10 years later. Um, which unfortunately, like I think 
is true for certain organizations. And then there's other organizations, um, other like food banking organizations that like want to perpetuate or like not want to perpetuate, but like want to continue existing, right? And so they like don't make systemic changes um, that affect communities and affect like community um, food insecurity, right? So we kind of see them like perpetuating the issue itself. Um, and so like for folks here who might work at food banks thinking about whether um, your organization's like principles and values and philosophies are in line more with like a food charity approach or a food justice approach, right? And kind of like critically questioning that I think is, is really important. Thanks for sharing that, Alicia. Okay, so I just wanted to highlight some food justice initiatives that I think kind of like demonstrate some of these values and principles that I mentioned. Um, so the first one here is to Toronto plant life, and this is like local to me, um, I'm sure, and I would love to hear from folks if there are local food justice initiatives in New Brunswick that you know, please feel free to share them in the chat. Um, but to Toronto plant life is a really, really cool, really rad um, indigenous youth led garden and small scale farm here in Toronto or Toronto, um, and they grow traditional food and medicines. Um, for Indigenous folks. It's led by Indigenous folks and they distribute medicine and food to Indigenous communities across the city. Um, they just started, I think like a year ago or so, um, and they've really grown a lot. They farm in partnership with Food Share at one of our urban farms in the west end of the city. Um, and it's completely like Indigenous youth led, like no one is over like 25 who's running this, this organization, which I think is pretty like, exciting to see young people um, doing this kind of work. Um, and that is a very good example of like a local, very like small scale based um, food justice initiative. So again, feel free to share in the chat if you can think of anything similar um, in New Brunswick. And then I've got um, kind of more broadly here at a national level. Another example is Justice for Migrant Workers. So Justice for Migrant Workers is a political volunteer-led collective advocating for the rights of migrant farm workers in the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program. Um, so I actually organize with Justice for Migrant Workers, so I'm a bit biased, um, but we do a lot of work kind of like at different levels of um, the government. So we'll like advocate and demonstrate like at a municipal level, depending on what town we're in. Uh, we also like to focus on the provincial and the federal level, right? So like understanding how all of these systems are intertwined and then making or pushing for changes um, that affect migrant farm workers at each of these levels. Um, and for those of you who do folks like, are folks familiar with the seasonal agricultural worker program? I see some nods. Some ish. <laughs> um, so I do encourage folks, if you aren't familiar with it, to, to look into the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program or SAWP. Um, it's a federal level program that brings uh, migrant farm workers into Canada every year um, from like Indo Caribbean countries. I think there's 12 countries currently participating in the program. The first one, the first one was Jamaica, and now it's kind of expanded to like Mexico and Guatemala and a few other places. Um, but the workers who come in through this program are predominantly uh, black and brown, often like indigenous in their own home countries. Um, and they come to Canada every year to farm all of the delicious um, produce that we get on our tables across Canada. Um, and these folks work in very, very like oppressive working conditions. Um, they don't have access, like they don't have a pathway to permanent residency in Canada, despite often coming back for like 20 years at a time. Um, they really like struggle to access healthcare here. They can get deported for disagreeing with their bosses. Um, it's it's very like precarious situation for folks um, and important to recognize that they're like the backbone of our agricultural system across the country. Um, so this I think is a good example too of like a food justice initiative that's not necessarily like about food access but it's about the system as kind of like a broader model, right? Like, how do we talk about our food chain? How do we talk about where our food is coming from? And how do we talk about like, decent work and like, decent living conditions for the people who are so deeply embedded within that food chain and that food system. So that's an example of a national food justice initiative. 
Um, and then the last one I wanted to highlight is La Via Campesina, which is an international movement. Um, so, so inspiring and rad. Um, they've been around for decades. They are an international food sovereignty movement that coordinates peasant organizations of small and middle scale producers, agricultural workers, rural women, and indigenous communities from all over the world. Um, they coined the term like food sovereignty, <laughs> like they really have done so much incredible organizing work globally um, around our global food chain, around workers' rights, around farmers' rights. Um, and again, this is, I think, a really great example of how when we talk about food justice, like there are so many different levels of advocacy, of organizing that we can engage in, right? Um, and it goes from like so, so micro local to just like literally across the entire world. And there's so many folks to connect with and so many interesting changes that can be made um, and have been made, right? I think, you know, um, I can't, I think maybe it was Nadine who said in the chat, like talking about all of these kind of like systems of oppression and structures that are like quite violent and like shape people's lives. Like it can be overwhelming, it can feel really heavy and it can often make us feel kind of powerless in the face of these systems, right? And for me, one of the things that gives me the most hope and makes me feel like most inspired to make change is, is looking at all of the incredible things that people are doing on the ground and have been doing for decades and decades, right? And then taking inspiration from those initiatives and understanding like, how do we plug into those? How do we get involved and like, what can we do to move forward together? Um, I see Lisa in the chat says, Sustainer Container, great name, um, is a help yourself um, garden located in, Ch I don't, is it Chown? I don't know how to pronounce that. Shown Fields. <laughs> um, it planted and cared for by the community. Uh, ACAP and SG Learning Exchange participants this year and working with the Learning Exchange to grow everything from seed in the classroom. The standard container is a shipping crate that has been turned into a living building, which holds 160 plants. Yeah, that's incredible. That's like such a great example of something happening on the ground in your community. Um, something that someone is actually engaged in and a part of. Um, it sounds like a really like creative solution to, you know, responding to all of these kind of like sites of oppression within our food system. Um, I love any kind of like creative shipping crate solution too. So that's amazing. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing that, Lisa. Um, so this is, I think, a good time uh, for folks to continue sharing in the chat. Um, I would love to hear other initiatives that people are a part of on the ground in your own communities. Um, I see Kate says we've recently acquired a microgreen adventure. Oh, shoots, <laughs> a very grassroots social enterprise idea, growing microgreens within our programs. They learn how to plant, grow, harvest, and nutritious grains together. Amazing. Um, I love any kind of like youth led initiative. I think, you know, if we look, especially at like climate organizing across the globe right now, like youth are the ones doing it, they know how to change the world. And so anything like involving youth and empowering youth, I think is so important when it comes to like food justice organizing. That sounds incredible. I'm also a big fan of microgreens. So uh, that sounds really dope. Um, so yeah, I just like want folks to kind of take a minute to reflect here and share in the chat anything else you're a part of, um, but also thinking kind of a bit critically, um, you don't have to share this answer in the chat right now, maybe this is a question you kind of take forward into the next few sessions of, of these trainings, but, you know, considering how we've looked at kind of like food charity, we've looked at food justice work, um, just thinking about your own work and where you see your work located currently. Um, and you know, if you're seeing your work kind of more reflected in a charity-based approach, considering what changes you could make, uh, whether that's you know changes that will cost money or changes that are just kind of like value-based, uh, to shift your work more towards like a food justice approach, right? Away from this charity-based model. Um, thinking about changes you could make to make that work that you're doing, the work you're engaging in, uh, more justice and rights-based driven, right? Um, Again, this is like a big question and it might be a question that needs to be addressed in like teams and like through collaboration with like your coworkers and the folks who are like driving your organization. But I think it's a really important one to consider. And it's something that like over the past six years at FoodShare, we've really been focused on. We've kind of like really shifted um, our entire organizational like principles and values 
to be more aligned with like a food justice approach over the past few years. So it's it's hard to do, like it's a lot, it's a big undertaking, but it's really important, I think, um, as we kind of like work to create new or not even create new solutions, but just like realign the work that we do and, and better support the work that's, that's already happening. Um, yeah, so feel free to share in the chat any like ideas, thoughts you have. If you have questions for me, um, I know I didn't talk too much about the work that FoodShare does, but if folks have questions about the work that FoodShare does, I'm happy to answer them as well. Um, yeah, we have like a couple minutes, I think. So, so feel free to, to share anything. Just this so I can see folks' faces. Okay, so I see here, my employer is Farmers Truck. We supply custom mobile farmers markets to nonprofits throughout America, amazing. One of the issues when it comes to food insecurity is like location, right? And so like coming directly into communities is an important thing for sure. Um, I think it's important to educate children about healthy food choices and financial literacy so they'll understand issues and come up with creative solutions to challenging to these challenging issues for sure. Yeah, right. I mean, kids like often don't have power over what they're eating, um, don't get to decide like what their families are buying. Um, and so like considering, you know, how do we like educate kids and ensure they're like learning all of the skills that they will need in the future. But also one of the things that we do in our like children learning programs at FoodShare is making sure that we never make kids feel bad about the things that they're eating either. Um, so like, here, like empowering them to be able to like make those decisions when they do have access to making those decisions, but at the same time being like, it's okay if you're only eating fast food right now, or it's okay if you're like having to go to a food bank, right? Because like, like we said, even as adults, it can be feel, it can feel really like helpless to talk about these systems. And so like thinking about like, if you're a kid, how helpless you might feel um, in the face of these, these um, sites of oppression, right? Um, seniors and people with special food allergies or food restrictions they miss a lot for sure right um and also like disabled folks who might have like certain like medical requirements around food um that's another really like big thing to consider right so like in our programming um thinking about people's like not just like their like food restrictions but like food preferences i think is a good way to frame it um just like making sure that we're catering to what people want to eat and like what is going to make them feel best in their bodies um, we serve food deserts, though not so much locally. I hope my employer will focus on MD and due course. Yeah, for sure, right? And, and like one thing you might consider is like, yeah, the language of food deserts and like how we frame um, like geographic areas that don't have as much access to food and like questioning like why. Um, I think it's important to educate children on how to prepare healthy food. Many students are expected to make their own lunches, but often do not have the know-how for sure again like in this idea of like empowering kids is really important, right? Um, and then also one thing I will say around like food education is I think it's really crucial and like a lot of people might not have access to the education and learning around um, preparing food, but also thinking about like, you know, I think there's a misconception and this is a result of like the way that states often like frame funding for food programming communities is that, um, we often assume that people don't know how to make food or don't know how to prepare food. Um, but often like the reality is like people do know how to prepare food. They just don't have the money to buy it, right? So like people probably like who have diabetes or who have certain food um, like requirements or restrictions, like they probably know what's best for them and they probably know how to cook it. Um, but whether or not they like make enough money to be able to buy the food they need to cook that is, is something we need to like critically question. Like, for example, a big learning experience for me was I ran a program at FoodShare for men living in a homeless shelter here in Toronto. Um, and I thought <clears throat> going into the program, I designed it as a program where we would like get really um, kind of like affordable ingredients, um, really like minimal kind of like cooking equipment. So we were like, we'll cook everything in a microwave or a hot plate and we'll like teach them how to make like chili with just four ingredients. They're like things that come out of cans. Um, and they came to the first session, we made the chili. They were like, 
yeah, it's good. Um, and I was like, what do you want to cook next week? And they were like, oh, well, we want to cook like this extremely like elaborate feast. Um, you know, like I know how to make like a pot roast from when I like lived with my mom or like, I want to make pancakes from like the first time I came to Canada. And it's like, folks probably like have a lot of like really great food skills and food experiences. And it's just about access, right? And so like um, the most important thing for me when I'm designing programming is going in with like, what is like, I don't actually know what people want. So like, I just need to ask and like, what is it that would best serve you and like make you happiest in the kitchen um, while we're here together, right? And like, if I have programming money to like go buy a pork roast, then like, we're gonna do that. And I'm not gonna try to like teach you how to make mac and cheese on a, in a like pressure cooker or whatever, right? <laughs> um, yeah, and Natasha says, or whether they have dishes and facilities to cook food properly. It's also like a really um, important, question um we found that coming up a lot during the pandemic when we had to shift to like virtual programming um we you know we were used to bringing people into the kitchen at food share and then we went from not being able like being able to serve all these folks who didn't have access to kitchen spaces to like not being able to serve them at all or like reach them at all because you can't like cook from home on zoom if you don't have a laptop if you don't have wi-fi if you don't have a kitchen that you like you know don't share with five other people um, so all of these things, again, are questions to consider when we're designing programming for people. Um, let's see, there's a lot of comments in the chat. Um, again, a comment around like vegan, gluten-free, kosher, for sure, like the current food bank model does not often take those things into consideration. So thinking about people's diverse like uh, tastes and also like requirements. Um, learned about a seed saving group near me. Um, seed saving is such an important part of food justice, food sovereignty. Um, I, I don't know a ton about seed saving, but I really am inspired by like the people I know who do engage in that, especially folks who are doing kind of like traditional seed saving. Um, I think it's like a really rad way to like move away from corporate agriculture, right? To like own seeds. and. And also like when you look, when you talk about like the corporate takeover of agriculture, like we see folks like Bill Gates and all these other like kind of like big billionaires who are like owning the rights to seeds now, right? And so like seed saving is a really, really like interesting way to kind of like push back against this corporate takeover. Um, there's a really great um, organization called A Growing Culture um who are like kind of a global focused organization and they do a lot of really great explainers on like corporate takeover takeover of agriculture but also like really interesting seed saving um movements across the world um so i encourage folks to kind of check that out um cool so it looks like we are almost out of time here. I'm just gonna read this last comment here from Holly. There's a young girl back in my home province who started a little free pantry in her city, only two years. She's expanded four pantries that are all community needs driven and specifically help those who have difficulty accessing food banks too. Yeah, that's an incredible um, example of mutual aid too, which we didn't talk too much about today, but I encourage folks to like consider and like look into like really rad mutual aid initiatives happening in your own neighborhoods. I know during the pandemic here in Toronto, so many cool groups kind of popped up um, and mutual aid is like, has a really long history. Um, you could look at like the Black Panthers and like their like feeding kids program they did, the free breakfast program or like um, so many indigenous communities that engaged in mutual aid for like years and years and years. Um, so I think that's like another really cool part of like food justice and like pushing for food justice and something that can kind of like shift away from food banking right this like community driven response um but yeah i think i'm out of time so i will hand it back over to the facilitators <laughs> thank you so much participant on est déjà à la fin de la session pouvez vous créer ça comme qu'on dit uh, <laughs> thank you well, here we are at the very end of our session an extraordinary session. I sure did learn a lot, and I'm so glad that we all got to um, learn from you. Uh, we're so, so grateful that you agreed to be our guest and that you could share your knowledge with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.